Crisis 3, I know it, I love it. It's the game I always load up first to get an idea of how powerful a new piece of hardware actually is. Now, there's a reputation here for punishing any and all gaming kit with this game, but Crisis 3 is also scalable too. And what you're seeing here is the game running on an Ultrabook, a super slim and light two-in-one convertible, no less. Okay, so, um, wow. This is the Dell XPS 13 7390, and I honestly reckon it's one of the best looking and best feeling laptops I've ever used. I actually bought this one myself because, well, my old Retina MacBook Pro is starting to show its age, and Apple's OS really isn't doing it for me these days. But that's by the by, because another key reason I wanted to get this machine in is because it's powered by Intel's new Ice Lake architecture. In this case, the Core i7 1065G7, powered by a new quad-core chip, backed up by Iris Plus graphics, and all fabricated on Intel's long-awaited 10 nanometer fabrication node. Intel reckons that this new SoC is capable of pretty solid gaming, and after putting it through some exhaustive testing, I think I'm inclined to agree, with some caveats. And I'm not messing about here. I went into this project with one intention, to run the entire Crisis Trilogy on an Ultrabook 2-in-1 convertible, with the aim being to hit 60 frames per second, no less. And as I had the chance to take a look at a brand new Intel architecture, I also hooked it up to an RTX 2080 Ti via an eGPU enclosure, so look out for those tests later on in this video. Yes, indeed, it is about more than just Crisis, but before we get on to all of those tests, Let's take a closer look at the XPS itself and why I love the form factor. Okay, so this is indeed a convertible, meaning that first of all, we need an ultra-thin form factor, something the XPS pulls off beautifully. The screen is effectively without bezels, lowering the size of the overall footprint, while in terms of thickness, about half an inch there. At less than three pounds, or around 1.3 kilos, it's super light and ultra-portable, and of course, being a convertible, you can use it like a laptop, or use the hinged design to make it into a jumbo tablet. Or you can set it up like this for presentations, media viewing, or whatever. You could even make it lie flat if that has any kind of value for you. The cost of this form factor? Well, from my perspective, it comes with two key compromises. First of all, the port selection is pretty awful. Yes, you get two USB-Cs, one either side, and at least they are both enabled for Thunderbolt 3 support, meaning that both of them can charge the unit and they can power a display as well. There's also a micro SD slot there too, but yeah, you're gonna need dongles and hubs to get much in the way of meaningful connectivity out of this machine. Oh, and yes, I've really got to talk about the screen. First of all, it's 16 by 10 in terms of aspect ratio, which for productivity, I'd take over standard widescreen any day of the week. Now, this is the so-called 4K display, which actually delivers an astonishing 3840 by 2400 resolution. On top of that, this screen is actually HDR enabled. Peak brightness apparently tops out at about 400 nits, meaning that SDR can look a bit dim if you do indeed enable HDR but you do get a pretty convincing effect on HDR content, and I was quite impressed, actually. But if you're here looking at a Digital Foundry video, you're interested in performance, am I right? The idea of a quad-core Intel CPU in this small form factor is pretty compelling, and if you pluck a benchmark out of thin air to get some idea of what this thing can do, well, Cinebench R15 looks very, very impressive. On a single thread run, the 1065G7 seemingly outperforms a Core i7-4790K at stock speeds. And while it loses pace against that 4790K in multi-threaded performance, 86% of its overall score isn't bad, right? Well, benchmarks do flatter to deceive, as I shall demonstrate later on. But one thing I need to point out straight away is that getting this score actually required dipping into the Dell power management area and switching the machine to ultra performance mode. This took CPU frequencies up to around 3.3 GHz across all cores before dropping to around 3.0 as the heat really kicked in. 
In the XPS's default configuration, the multi-score was just 330 points as CPU clocks settled at an all-core turbo of just 1.6 GHz. And this presents a bit of a problem for me as my four-year-old dual-core MacBook Pro gets pretty much the same score. And there are reasons why Dell doesn't enable ultra performance mode out of the box. But I'll return to that when it comes to testing the processor with the 2080 Ti attached. But let's skip to the main event, the Crisis Trilogy, and my attempts to get some of my favorite PC games running on an ultra thin convertible with a ridiculously tight thermal budget. And I'm gonna do the games in reverse order, kicking off with my go-to game for getting the measure of hardware performance. And yes, as I mentioned earlier, that is Crisis 3. To begin with, 1920 by 1200 resolution, 16 by 10, high resolution textures and medium settings. I'm using Reva Tuner Statistics Server to lock to 30 FPS here. I mean, let's be realistic, right? And well, this intro cutscene is notoriously hard on GPU power with those rain effects soaking up bandwidth. 30 frames per second is delivered, which I thought put me on the right track, but as we progress into gameplay, we dip down hard into the mid-20s. However, 1440 by 900, still a 16 by 10 ratio for the XPS screen. It's actually holding up pretty well, and it continues to do so when we enter the punishing jungle scene. And moving into our CPU benchmark area, which stresses both CPU and GPU, we actually have a nice steady performance level. The third stage in Crisis 3 is very taxing as well for different reasons, but I've found enough overhead to push up some of the advanced graphics to high with only minor dips to performance under 30 FPS. And returning to the first stage, an altogether different test of CPU and GPU resources, we're still good. But what about 60 frames per second? Can it be done? A 13 inch screen like this is pretty tolerant to low resolution gaming and I could do it, even though it required setting up a custom 1024 by 640 resolution. I could run Crisis 3 on an Ultrabook convertible at 60 frames per second. It's actually pretty neat to behold there. But some might say that the compromises are too punishing. To begin with, you will note that the CPU temperatures are getting blazingly hot here, as if they weren't hot enough already. 80 to 90 degrees and beyond, and at some point you will even hit 100. And is that 60 frames per second action locked? Well, here you can see that in the jungle stage it isn't. But I did chance across a rather novel solution of sorts. The XPS 13's amazing 4K screen has a 48Hz mode presumably for slick, consistent playback of 24 FPS movie and TV content. And while enabling that cuts off my capture feed, you can see from the filmed footage here that locking to 48 FPS is pretty consistent. Cools down the CPU a bit and allows you a little more headroom to play around with graphics presets if that's what you want. A locked 60 frames per second then, well, kind of yes and no, really. It was yes in a cold room, funnily enough, but performance dropped elsewhere. Overall, though, you can configure Crisis 3 to be eminently playable on the XPS, and I was quite surprised at how well 48 FPS looked and felt. And if only we could have adaptive sync on this display. But I digress. Crisis 2 next, and a game that was actually really well optimized in its day, well, that should run without too much in the way of issues on a brand new 2019 laptop. I mean, back in the day, 720p60 on an NVIDIA 8800 GT was doable. So let's take a look. 1920 by 1200 first. That 16 by 10 aspect ratio to match the laptop screen. DX11 was a write-off, but DX9 can work fairly well, though perhaps I am pushing it by opting for the extreme preset here. Mid-20s to mid-30s isn't bad, but I kind of prefer consistency to my gaming and not even dropping to the high preset, which is actually equivalent to everybody else's low, that doesn't solve the issues. Still, if you want to push graphics, there's some nice tweaking possible here, and even on high, low, whatever Crytek deemed to call it back in the day, I think this game looks pretty decent many years on. But 60 frames per second, Let's do it. 1280 by 800, again, 16 by 10, equivalent to 720p if you like. Most of the game plays out at 60 frames per second. Drop it to high and you're pretty much there. And I've got to say, I really enjoyed this and the notion of the game running like this on an ultrabook 
really is very satisfying when you're actually seeing it all play out in front of you on that beautiful screen. But yes, yeah, similar to Crisis 3, while it is possible to lock to 60 uh, in cooler ambient conditions, in a warmer room, I did find the XPS thermal solution overwhelmed. And there's the sense here that you're on a knife edge. And I think that a 30 FPS cap may make a ton of sense on a lot of games. Quite literally, the silicon gets more breathing room and won't be pushed too hard. Buoyed with success on Crisis 2 and its sequel, I went into the OG game with some trepidation. Yes, it will utilize four cores on a quad-core processor, but just not very well. Crisis hails from an era where the developer bet the farm on CPU frequencies going higher as opposed to spreading out workloads across more cores something the developer championed in its subsequent games. You can see here that in the core utilization in Reaver Tuner, one core is targeted aggressively while the other cores get far less utilization, while four threads are barely touched upon at all. At 1920 by 1200, frame rates are not so bad by the looks of things. Not great, but the evidence suggests that we have room to maneuver. Consistency really isn't the game's strongest suit though, and in the hands, the game just doesn't feel right. Dropping to 1280 by 800, I tried targeting 60 frames per second, and while overall performance is obviously higher, the inconsistency actually felt even more off-putting. I had more luck with 1920 by 1200 with Reva Tuner's 30 FPS cap in place, but again, I seem to hit the same problem I had in previous Crisis games, where consistency in the experience seemed to depend on the surrounding ambient temperature where I was playing. This game still looks amazing and seeing it play out on a laptop, well, that's pretty awesome. But the key difference here is that I had a lot of fun with Crisis 2 and 3 on the XPS, but the battle to get decent performance on the OG game didn't really pay off. And in the end, I found the experience rather frustrating. The frame rates might look okay here, but the actual feel wasn't. But looking across the three games, I'd say that this is a pretty impressive showing overall, right? I mean, this is an integrated graphics solution on a really tight thermal budget. Well, on the more heavily optimized later titles, Crisis seemed to work out pretty well, I'd say. Beyond my Crisis fetish, I ran Destiny 2 at 1440x900 on medium settings, uh, pretty much closely locked to 30fps, and The Witcher 3 720p medium again at 30fps. This isn't high-end gaming, but as a value-added extra for an ultrabook designed for very, very different use cases, I'd say that's pretty impressive. But getting these results isn't easy. To get consistency in performance, you really do need to have the ultra-performance mode active, and when that's in play, managing thermals really is very, very challenging. I suspect we're going to be moving significantly beyond the 15-watt thermal limit here, and during the crisis tests, I seem to get more consistent performance performance by having the door open and having some bracing autumnal air blowing in. So yeah, I just get the idea that while Ice Lake is an extremely capable processor, the XPS though, it isn't really designed for pushing clocks hard, hence the optimized mode running at an all-core turbo of around 1.6 GHz. And I can kind of illustrate the issue here with the eGPU test I did. Right, so this is the almost legendary Ashes of the Singularity CPU test. As the RTX 2080 Ti is handling all of the graphics duties, such as they are, the CPU side of the SoC can really stretch its legs. But here's the thing, while the 1065 G7 holds its own against the Core i7-3770K and even gets close to the 4790K, well, the more you push into the benchmark, the more the laptop chip seems to throttle back. So I don't actually think that this benchmark has much meaning here because the longer you run it, the worse the result overall. Ashes is a massively multi-threaded CPU bench, so I also tried something a little different. Our classic Crisis 3 CPU bench. Now, I'm pretty sure that here we're thermally constrained right out of the box here. CPU temperatures are hitting anything up to 95 degrees. I just didn't let the machine cool down before I tried this test. Clocks drop therefore, and you can see that the 3770K and 4790K maintain a pretty consistent advantage. You get around 79% of a 3770K's performance and 67% of a 4790K. But I'd be willing to bet that with a higher TDP and a better cooling solution, the results would be very, very different on the Ultrabook. 
And yeah, I am comparing a two-in-one convertible here to desktop PC technology, backed up by relatively enormous cooling power. And yeah, there is much more to come from Intel's 10 nanometer chip. Ice Lake notebooks with a 25 watt TDP are a thing. Notebooks with better coolers are coming and even notebooks with discrete GPUs are en route. This is pretty cool actually, because it means that the CPU won't be held back by graphics duties. I'm eyeing the new Razer Blade Stealth as it combines a 25 watt Ice Lake i7 with a GTX 1650. It's a very different animal to this XPS 13 2-in-1, which is made for a very different market and very different tasks. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, I had to return the XPS to Dell. As good as it is for many, many tasks and as stunning as the form factor and the construction is, I need to have my laptop upgrade to have much more power out of the box than my Mac. Now the XPS is capable of that, but it involves invoking that ultra performance mode, which then causes heat issues and of course troublesome fan noise. In its standard optimized mode, I'm not seeing a meaningful upgrade, all of which is to say that my quest for a replacement laptop continues. But hey, with some careful tweaking, this XPS can produce very decent results on a range of games that an integrated graphics solution has historically had no business to run. As a value add to an Ultrabook convertible, it is compelling, but if you're after a fire and forget mobile gaming solution with little in the way of tweaking required, this one isn't for you. Anyway, thanks for indulging me on this one. I had a lot of fun putting this video together because basically, well, I love tuning and tweaking less capable PC hardware just to see what kind of experience I can get from it. I do think Intel's Ice Lake architecture has a ton to offer which we've barely explored here across many different markets and I'm looking forward to returning to it with a product that's perhaps more directly aimed at gamers. I'd still love to have an Ultrabook with the CPU power to wipe the floor with my Retina MacBook Pro without overheating strong enough to hook up via an external GPU for a higher fidelity gaming experience. But the quest continues and that's where I'm leaving things for now. Please do like and subscribe as ever to support the work we do here at Digital Foundry. The bell, well, that's there to be rung. And I invite you to do so to get instant notifications whenever we post a new DF video. For the ultimate supporters of our channel, I invite you to check out our Patreon see our videos in source file quality and rest easy safe in the knowledge that you're more directly supporting the team in creating videos like this but that's all for me for now thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one if indeed you did and on a more general level thanks to everyone for watching and supporting digital foundry